you know, speaking of uh, taking charge of your financial well-being, it is time to unmask the global and local opportunities and risks that lie ahead for the rest of 2021. And just like what I said earlier, we will be hearing straight from ProLife UK's fund managers. And tonight we have distinguished representative from our global fund manager, Eastbury Investments, and also two of our experts from our local fund manager, ProLife UK Investments. And so let us start off our discussion with uh, Eastbury Investments. Now, let me share with you a bit about uh, eSpring, okay? Who is eSpring and what do they do? eSpring Investments is a part of the Prudential PLC, which is the mother company of Real Life UK. And it is a, a global asset manager offering innovative investment solutions, of course, focused on the Asian market. That is their core. And uh, over the last 25 years, eSpring has uh, successfully built an on-the-ground presence in 11 Asian uh, markets, as well as the, some distribution offices in North America and Europe. And currently, they are managing a total of 248 billion US dollars that is on behalf of institutional and um, individual investors globally who entrusted their hard earned money to eSpring. And uh, not just that, eSpring being you know, the Asia's top and the multi awarded asset management house. They have also been recently awarded as the 2021 Asset Management Company of the Year for the ASEAN category during the Asset AAA Sustainable Investing Award. And tonight, we are very happy to have the Investment Director of eSpring Investments, Mr. David Hollis. And allow me very quickly just to share with you his background. David has uh, over 90 years of experience in asset classes. And he also is uh, currently a portfolio manager in the uh, investment solutions team and is responsible for the investment strategy, tactical asset allocation, and uh, performance of several East Springs global multi-asset funds. And uh, David holds a Bachelor of Science first class honors in the economics from the London School of Economics, London, UK. And uh, here to share his insights on the global financial markets. Join me in welcoming Mr. David Hollis. Good evening, David, and welcome to ProWise Webinars. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Hopefully you can hear me. That was a very good introduction. I hope everyone's excited now. All right. We can hear you clearly. So the floor is yours now, David. Take it away. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm going to share, just momentarily talk between yourselves. I'm going to share my presentation so you can all look at some slides. These are very interesting times. So <clears throat> I thought I'd, I'd summarize the three key themes that we see for the outlook for both uh, global equities and global bonds and the component parts um, that I'll talk about within this presentation. First of all, developed market equities. I mean, they've done really well this year. Uh, we do expect that to continue to do to a degree, but we are moving from what I would term early cyclical to, to um, mid-cycle, uh, as you're starting to get um, the Federal Reserve talk about withdrawing stimulus somewhat. Uh, and that opens the opportunity set to more regional divergence. divergence. We're already seeing that to a degree uh, with the dollar outperforming and US equities outperforming in the last couple of weeks against Europe. And as well, similarly, you've seen a meaningful drop in some of the emerging market equities, um, equity markets uh, compared to the US. So you're starting to see that regional divergence, and that will be a key theme that will play out uh, the second half of this year and into 2022. We do, however, remain still very bullish on equities. Um, you know, we have a maximum overweight position based on our uh, process and strategies. Uh, and it's not as if we're going to experience a recession. And generally speaking, you don't necessarily want to underweight equities until you expect a recession. The other thing I'm putting out is I've touched on already, which is that of emerging market stocks. So unfortunately, we do see continued weakness here. It's going to be exacerbated by the lag in vaccination rates within these economies. Um, this is unduly impacting the ASEAN group of countries where the vaccination rates, unfortunately, are quite low. But the good news is that they will play catch up. And at some point, many of these economies, as the vaccination rates do take hold and move to sustainable levels, then we'll begin to see 
um, a meaningful catch up in the stock markets versus the rest of emerging markets and indeed relative to developed markets. And finally, um, on US Treasuries, so we still are, we still maintain an underweight in US Treasuries. Uh, I'd say we're a little more cautious on that underweight. Treasuries have come back a lot as the Federal Reserve has tried to appease the market and not um, allow it to price in too much of a tightening in, in monetary policy via the expectation of a tapering in stimulus in, in purchases. Um, we're looking at long-term structural inflation and as you'll see later, it's, it's not something we're overly concerned about currently. So they're the three main themes. It is that uh, regional divergences within equity markets will be a stronger theme uh, for the next six to 12 months. Unfortunately, emerging markets will lag probably the rest of developed markets. And um, we're still underweight on uh, bonds in the US, uh, but we do note some technical improvement recently. I'll move on to the next slide. So this is um, our dashboard, as we call it. This is one of our dashboards, and this is literally global equities versus US investment grade government bonds. Uh, we, we look at various factors we think are going to influence equities versus bonds, and then we add them all up. Uh, sometimes we constrain the weights, but broadly speaking, on the far left, you've got valuation, then a technical, and then some fundamentals, and you just sum them up. So currently, you can see that the composite score or total score is plus five, and the range is from minus five here on the dashboard to plus five. So we're very bullish at the moment. If we go through the individual signals, you can see that uh, from a valuation perspective, uh, on our measures at least, we're not unduly expensive. Um, we still find valuations quite attractive. Technicals are certainly quite supportive at the moment. This NDR equity sentiment is something that we use as a collated signal to try and ascertain whether the market is overbought or oversold. And currently it's around neutral levels. So despite the equity market having done really quite well in the last few months, uh, we still don't see overbought signals emerging. Um, and fundamentals, broadly speaking, we're losing a lot of business sentiment indicators here, some earnings revisions and some macro risk and data um, relative to expectations. Um, apart from one downgrade here recently, it's a broad-based positive picture for fundamentals. So let's look at what markets have done in the first half of the year. It's been a very good story for US equities leading the way, and that's been exacerbated somewhat by dollar strength. We've had a bit of a pullback um, in Europe, where, which was outperforming the US for a while, a few months ago. Ordinarily, you would expect that Europe would take over the leadership of the US in the economic cycle roughly 12 to 18 months after the US has peaked. So as US moves from early to mid cycle, then Europe goes into early cycle. Unfortunately, the recent COVID waves and the low vaccination rates in Europe have meant that some people are, are, are fearful of the upcoming winter season. And as well, you've had talk of taper in the US that supported the currency there. In contrast, admittedly, emerging markets are still higher than we began the year. So at, they too benefit from the stimulus measures, both locally and globally, but it's been a, a less positive story. But an 8% return is still not to be um, disappointed with. On the right hand side, it, it goes back to what I said earlier. We've already had quite large regional divergences year to date. You'll notice the US is right at the top here at 14.8, and Taiwan here, some might be surprised by that. TSMC, which is a semiconductor. Um, producer in Taiwan can, can meaningfully drive this index and shortages have caused that to rally sustainably. Um, so up the top, a lot of the developed markets um, and, and further down, you've got emerging markets. Unfortunately, the ASEAN sector is lagging somewhat. Indonesia is suffering from uh, increasing COVID cases more recently and as well, Malaysia and the Philippines. But hopefully that will change once vaccination rates improve. Let's move on to have a bit of a look at the global economy generally. And it's been really good 
you know, year to date, the bounce out of um, sort of relatively weak sentiment in the left hand chart. So this represents US business sentiment and is a measure of new order sentiment within the manufacturing and services sector. If we're above the 50 line, it means good news. The economy is expanding usually and um, below is a contraction. So you can see, um, actually, this doesn't go back that far, but if you're over 60, 65, that really is around the peak of the uh, series that we've ever experienced. And that, that is, that is, um, that runs back ever such a long way. But you can see we started to roll off a bit. And this chimes with our view that we're moving from early to late cycle. On the right hand side, early to mid cycle, sorry. On the right hand side, you can see the new orders indicator for the whole of the developed market. And as well here, um, you've seen a pullback from highs in May 61, roughly pulling back to 59. So there's some moderation in that uptrend. And, and that's a good thing because otherwise inflation gets out of control and the Federal Reserve has to respond with raising interest rates and that will cause the economy to go back into recession. So some moderation on sentiment is fine. Uh, that being said, you know, we have had a lot, uh, a broad based up move in equities generally. Um, much of the easy gains are behind us, I would say. The left hand chart and the bottom, it represents something called equity risk premium. <clears throat> in simple terms, this is the amount you're going to get paid above and beyond the risk free rate. So here it, it's getting to decent levels. It was, you we weren't getting paid much for owning equities, but you're getting paid a lot more now. So it's largely reflected in the price, the, the ERP has risen. On the right hand side, we, we did, this is a scenario test. So if the US stocks have been really strong for the first six months, um, what happens for the rest of the year? So we're up about 12.5% year to date in the first six months. If you scroll down to the bottom here, you can see that at the very bottom, um, if we sum all them up, the percentage of times we've had a positive number is 75%. And then for a year, the hit rate is 70%. So there's a more than even chance, roughly three quarters chance we're going to get positive returns for the rest of the year. It would be highly unusual. 1987 is, um, I remember that, is uh, the stock market crash. So it's, it's highly unusual we do um, if we've been so strong in the first half of the year. Let's have a look now at what's been going on within the individual equity markets. So this is more about which sectors within the US economy, US index have done really well. And as you'd expect, energy is leading. As economies open up, the demand for, for energy goes up and therefore the price goes up. And that's effectively what's happened here. Um, as well, financials, which is banks and insurers, have done very well. Um, as, as the shorter dated yields drop, and longer dated yields rise because they borrow short and lend long, then banks do very well because their profit margins increase. Um, more recently, there's been a little bit of a plateauing out there. And um, <clears throat> until about May, NASDAQ, which is your technology stocks, was, was languishing somewhat, uh, but has improved as, um, as expectations are for a recovery. On the right hand side, this is probably a bit complicated um, for you to consider, but I will just talk around it. The gray bars are your recession. And this is, this is yield curve spread. So we're looking for periods when the yield curve steepens and generally the cyclical sectors do very well. Uh, and then when real yields rise. Um, so when the Federal Reserve tapers policy, historically, the gray line, which is on the right hand side and inverted, the gray line drops suddenly. So you can see that in 2008, it dropped suddenly. And then in 2000, as we came out of the recession in 2001, again, the same thing, real yields rise a lot when we come out of recession. And that means people are more optimistic on growth. The problem is at that point, the yield curve tends to flatten a lot. And it's not so good for the cyclical sectors. But then the yield curve re-steepens and the cyclicals come back. So whilst in the short term, you can see the gray line here. We've steepened, steepened, steepened. Um, and real yields, real yields have fallen because we want to have highly stimulatory monetary policy environment. And therefore, lots of growth coming. 
And then we're starting to see a reversal of that. And the red line as well is your yield curve, which is steep and steep and steep and then has flattened slightly. So that might continue for a bit. So in the interim cyclicals may be under pressure for three to six months. But once we get out the other side, they should reassert themselves. Uh, oh, one other thing to say is generally speaking, we find that when real yields are rising and the Federal Reserve is tapering policy, then the NASDAQ does very well. And that's one of our core traits within portfolios at the moment. So what's going to happen in terms of earnings and payouts? Well, the good news is that revisions ratios, which are a nice one of the few lead indicators for what's going to happen to earnings and prices in equity markets, are really quite robust. They've, they've risen, risen significantly across most markets, obviously in the US more than elsewhere. And indeed, they've come back a bit, which is good news. We don't want them too high. And that should lead to, you know, the expectation, at least reflected in 12 month forecast dividend growth, is we're going to see a big growth in dividends. So payouts should increase for, for um, most regions. Um, increasingly, we're seeing quite high expectations of dividend growth in emerging markets and Europe, much greater than in the US and Japan. So I spoke earlier about the regional divergence side of things, and it, it's probably worth looking at, uh, at what positions we have on in portfolios at the moment. So one of our key themes is unfortunately to underweight emerging markets. So at the moment, this is another model, very similar. This is our dashboard scorecard to tell us you know, how to position funds. On the left-hand side, you've got valuations, which we don't find attractive at the moment. We still think they're relatively expensive, um, on our measures at least. Um, technicals are quite a headwind, so it's been underperforming for quite a while and it's not moving higher. And, and the uh, fundamental side is, apart from economic data surprising on the upside somewhat, the uh, relative earnings per share um, on a three month change basis and earnings revision ratios, both of these are quite a drag. And so the fundamentals are a bit of a jag. So there's not much to, to recommend the, uh, the region at the moment. Unfortunately, it's not, not going to be a pretty picture I, I paint here for emerging markets. Uh, we're quite cautious on emerging markets as well because of the dollar strength. The Federal Reserve is clearly lead, leading the the global economy out of this. It's relatively well vaccinated and it, it's likely we're on a tapering path. So policy is probably going to tighten and relative interest rate differentials or expectations will reflect that very much. And the dollar is probably going to do pretty well in that environment. Uh, the other thing to watch out for is, is when dollar borrowing costs go up, then we tend to see weakness in emerging market share prices. That's, that's pretty given because a lot of the funding for emerging markets is in dollars, albeit it has been reduced relative to uh, you know, the um, previous 1998 emerging market crisis. It's not as large as it, it was, but the correlation even between you know, US rates and, and emerging market local debt, I, I have historically found to be very high. So even local debt is highly correlated to US rates. So if US rates go up, then that local debt is going to go down in um, value. I thought it worth looking at COVID because it does unfortunately plague markets and it actually makes their job very difficult. You know, one minute economy is opening up, the next minute it's shutting down. And that would be the general view for emerging markets. We've had a lot of false starts. Um, you can see that on the left-hand side, the vaccination rates for one shot in the different regions. The US is admittedly was early and is, is leading with around 50% and the Euro area. And then uh, within that is, is the UK, which I, I see very much as a test case for developed markets where vaccination rates are high enough now, they believe that they're going to reopen the economy in July fully. And so there'll be no more masks or anything. So we'll see whether that, the rates rise there. The, 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 the rates, the infection rates are rising, but the hospitalization rates are not nearly as high as they have been historically. LATAM, surprisingly, Brazil has a very good vaccination program. It's progressing very well. And back down at the bottom, you've got emerging market Asia and EMEA here. 
And on the right hand side, we've got one and two uh, shot vaccination rates where Canada is right at the top and um, South Africa, Philippines and Taiwan, unfortunately, right at the bottom here. But hopefully I've been reading about the vaccines arriving in the Philippines. So hopefully they'll get those rolled out soon. Briefly about US bonds. I indicated earlier that we were still underweight bonds, uh, slightly fearful on inflation. Uh, we are beginning to see on the left hand chart, you can see they look expensive, which we don't like them on the minus one on valuation. The technicals are a bit more supportive recently. Um, so we started to see our performance, you know, rise in prices of bonds as the Federal Reserve has reassured the market and as well that it won't taper too soon. And as well, um, inflation is not seen as endemic. So longer dated inflation expectations have fallen somewhat. Um, in contrast, the fundamentals, they're not quite there for us to, to go back to a neutral or even overweight position. Uh, the economic backdrop is too strong. If you've got a very strong economic backdrop, you want to be short duration, you want to be short bonds because bond prices will go down as yields will go up. But here um, you can see even in the fundamentals, the new orders three month change. So business sentiment is more neutral now. So it's, it's fallen back a bit. So it's getting weaker, which means economy is not as strong as what it was. So just to give you an indication of how far prices have moved, uh, the supply constraints are having meaningful impact on sentiment with regard to output prices. The left hand chart is manufacturing prices as reflected by a sentiment index in both the US and Europe. And these are very high numbers in the 70s. Um, and on the right hand side, services, Europe is lagging somewhat, but US again, service price pressure. So where exactly is that, that coming from? Uh, this, these charts explain why we're not too concerned about long-term inflation. On the left-hand side, you can see the light blue and pale blue. And these are, are very much contributions to core PCE. This is the Federal Reserve's favored measure of inflation um, above and beyond that calculated using the consumer price index. A lot of these price pressures, the blue lines turn from positive to negative based on base effects have been driven by you know, used cars, items that are produced in China, furniture, household appliance, electrical goods. All of this is driven by supply constraints. And if we, there is a corollary, if we look back in time after the Second World War, you know, you came out of, of the Second World War and there had been rationing for a long time. And as well, a lot of the industry was destroyed, so supply was weak. So that you had the double whammy of pent up demand and no supply or supply constraints. And we've got that now, essentially. Um, we've got the fact that supply is constrained by many emerging markets not being, like, being able to operate at full capacity. And you've got people in the developed market having been locked down for a long time. Maybe they're not traveling. They're not spending money, certainly on fuel. And they can afford to buy a new car if you've got a job and, and even if you haven't and you're being supported by the fiscal handouts from the US government, um, there's a lot of cash to spend and they're keen to spend it, but the goods just aren't there at the moment. That being said, on the right hand chart, you can see that once the supply came on board and the initial pent up demand evaporated uh, after about a year, then you started to see prices fall quite significantly. And, and by about two years later, two and a half years, they were back to normal. And that, that was a situation where the supply side of things had actually been completely decimated. You know, the production facilities have been decimated. We're just talking about temporary shutdowns. So it's still there. Um, so it should be restarted quicker. So that, that kind of explains why we're comfortable um, on the inflation, long-term inflation outlook. Um, we have got to a situation where, you know, the, the curve has begun to flatten. So 10 year yields and even 30 year yields have begun to fall back and two or five years are stable or rising. And that's a reflection of tapering of policy. So shorter term rates are reflecting the fact that, you know, short term policy path on the right hand side, um, that is moving higher, reflecting the fact that the rate cycle or at least reduced bond purchases from the Fed are going to take place. 
And then as you go further out, 10s, 30s, you can call it inflation at risk premium if you want. As they tighten short rates, then long-term inflation expectations tend to fall. Uh, and that's why that curve is falling here. I'm going to be cheeky uh, and, and just briefly outline our view on the local market. I'm sure the, the other fund managers will have their own views. But um, just in terms of the COVID situation, it is improving. Um, but vaccination rates in the Philippines are, remain some of the lowest worldwide. Uh, that being said, activity is probably on the up. Um, the CPI does look quite high, despite the government having introduced some price controls. The BSP forecasting is average inflation to be at 4%, which is the upper end of the band. Um, the peso is the biggest worry um, we personally have here at East Spring. Um, at the moment, the current account deficit has been really well behaved because people haven't been demanding um, imported goods to that degree. Um, that being said, as the economy opens up and people go back to work, that demand for dollar denominations will rise because they buy overseas good and that current account deficit will widen. Um, and you've got a situation where the, the Federal Reserve is clearly on a tightening path and the BSP is not. It is holding pat. It is looking through. And so that rate differential is causing the dollar to rise and the peso to fall. And the biggest risk for, for bonds certainly here is that the peso continues falling and you get this negative feedback loop uh, from you know, the peso weakening higher imported goods prices for food and energy and the CPI rises and the BSB doesn't react or it reacts too late, so it's behind the curve. But for now, we're, we're very bullish on equities, not very bullish, we're quite bullish on equities. Um, uh, you know, the market has managed to hold on to its recent gains um, as the economy has opened up. And certainly we prefer them over bonds at this point. And with the you know, vaccine rollout, we hope they will continue to move higher. I'm gonna pause there and ask um, if there are any questions at all. Thank you very much. Thank you once again, Investment Director of East Spring Investments, Mr. David Hollis. Thank you very much. And uh, probably in summary, allow me just to share that um, East Spring as uh, mentioned by David, maintains a maximum bullish stance on global equity. So this is actually great news, especially for those who are interested or who would want to, you know, explore investing in the global assets. So East Spring is telling you right now that they are bullish on global equities and that their strategy remains uh, significantly overweight or focused on the global equities with, of course, still an increased caution and uh, as risk uh, remain. And then they are underweight on global bonds. And uh, David also mentioned that uh, between emerging and developed markets, we expect the developed ones to uh, outperform the uh, emerging markets. And that growth we expect will be coming from uh, one of uh, the largest <laughs> economy in the world, which is the US. And of course, the key factors would be the strength of the US dollars and the high borrowing costs. And uh, also David shared that you know his outlook and his insights are uh, basically based on the overall vaccination progress for each region and that uh, um, business reopenings towards uh, economic recovery. We'll learn more from, uh, we'll hear from you more of uh, David later during our Q&A. David, thank you very much for that uh, very insightful presentation. So uh, at this point, we'd like to ask you to, if you can stay on because later we'll have a uh, Q&A together with, uh, with our two other speakers. So with that, thank you very much again, David, and uh, we'll see you later in our Thank you so much. Thank okay. you, everybody. Thank you so much. All right. And um, again, to all our attendees, uh, in case you have questions that you'd like to address uh, to David, you may take note of them or you may already drop them in our dedicated Q&A box. Okay. So again, David, see you later in our Q&A. And um, okay. So now from the global perspective, it's time to take a deep dive naman into the local financial market. So let us move closer to home. And um, David already gave us a, 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 a snippet of uh, what's happening in the local financial markets. But uh, at this point, we have invited two uh, distinguished experts from ProLife UK Investments, uh, the fund manager of ProLife UK's ProLink Equity Index Tracker Fund. And I am honored to uh, tell you a bit about ProLife UK Investments. ProLife UK Investments, uh, launched in 2019, offers a pure investment products through Unit Investment Trust Funds or UITFs 
to meet the ever-evolving uh, investment needs of Filipinos across the country. And currently, ProLife UK Investments is managing a wide array of 10 UITFs invested across different asset classes. ProLife UK Investments is uh, comprised of the country's top fund managers and investment team with a mission to help Filipinos achieve their financial goals through expert investment advice from over 3,049 certified investment advisors who can uh, give you a tailored fit and, of course, innovative wealth solutions, which are definitely suitable for every type of uh, investor. Now, here to update us on the conditions of the uh, Philippine bond markets, we have the Assistant Vice President and Head of Fixed Income of uh, Crew Life UK Investments, Mr. Ricky Madato. But before I turn over the floor to him, let me just uh, quickly give you a brief background um, about Mr. Ricky Madato. He held posts in both buy side and sell side of the capital markets in some of the country's top financial institutions as a fixed income portfolio trader and analyst and uh, eventually a fixed income and multi-asset fund manager. And then the head, he, he eventually became the head of the uh, credit uh, trading department handling both local and hard currency sovereign and corporate credits. He is also a chartered financial analyst or CFA and um, he has received several recognitions from the asset uh, industry which named him as one of the most astute investors in local currency bonds in 2011 and 2013, and one of the most astute investors in Asian G3 bonds in 2015 and 2016. Mr. Madato graduated from the Adenae de Manila, de Manila University with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Development Studies. And without further ado, here to share live with us the latest uh, about the uh, Philippine fixed income markets. Please help me in uh, welcoming our second speaker, Mr. Vicky Madatu, AVP and Head of Fixed Income of Blue Life UK Investments. Welcome, Sir Vicky. It's nice to have you again. Hey, uh, good evening, MJ. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for having me. As always, the floor is yours, Sir Vicky. All right. Uh, so let me just take this time to share my screen. Okay. Is that better? Yes, yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. So I'm here really to uh, do a deep dive on the local fixed income market. So before we get into the outlook and the first half, maybe uh, better to provide a recap of what we had in 2020, because this provides really the context that we're working with and how we can move forward from uh, the current pandemic and really the repercussions it has uh, in the financial markets. So back in 2020, uh, we saw actually a very favorable market for local fixed income uh, with higher uh, interest rate exposure really giving the uh, substantial returns. And this is mainly due to the central bank initiatives. So what we saw was really, uh, if you look at long duration bonds, uh, even the all bond index, uh, you have double digit returns. And this is mainly driven by the BSP. Uh, they cut in benchmark interest rates by 200 basis points. So we started uh, 2020 at 4%. And actually they were really planning to cut interest rates given that we really had a benign inflation environment. But given uh, due to the Due to the pandemic, they were uh, they accelerated uh, the benchmark interest rate cut really to provide support in terms of growth. So from 4% to 2%, that's a 200 basis points move. And that has really translated into a rally in, global, uh, in local fixed in income interest rates. And that's really the one that's providing really the returns for uh, the most of 2020. Uh, in terms of inflation, what we saw was that uh, in terms of average inflation at the end of the year, this actually provided some acceleration. So we started uh, 2019 at 2.5%, average at 3.5% at the end of 2020. Uh, but this is, again, coming from a much larger uh, inflation uh, situation back in 2018. 
And if you remember 2018, we really was uh, when inflation was hitting close to almost 7%. It was averaging at 5.2% for 2018. And that really provided a substantial returns also for 2019, wherein, where we saw inflation actually decelerated significantly. Now, in terms of GDP growth, uh, we saw a deceleration from 2019 at 5.9% to negative 9.5% for 2020. So that's really uh, one of the reasons why the BSP has cut interest rates by 200 basis points. In terms of global interest rates, which is, again, a major contributing factor for the local fixed income interest rate market, and the U.S. Federal Reserve cut their benchmark rates from 1.75% down to 0.25%, which is the upper bound of their interest rate corridor. And that's also down from 2.5% in 2018. So really, uh, for the past three years, we saw interest rates move much lower, again, driven by uh, central banks for both local and uh, global fixed income markets. If you look at the five and 10 year rates for US treasuries, uh, it was down 133 and 100 basis points respective, respectively. So at the end of 2020, that was really the context that we were working in. So again, uh, this is, uh, I think that it's helpful for us to provide a recap before we move on to what we saw in the first half of 2021 and in terms of our outlook in the next six months. All right, so in terms of our considerations and outlook, again, the main player that we want to focus on is really BSP. Uh, in terms of the overnight benchmark rate, uh, which has really provided the returns uh, in 2020, most likely this will remain unchanged at 2% until fourth quarter 2022. So I imagine we still have uh, a year and a half before we could even uh, see a rate hike uh, from the central bank. So this is unlikely. They are also unlikely to decrease rates further as current accommodation is deemed adequate. So uh, again, this would be the pin in terms of uh, inflation, uh, in terms of interest rate uh, outlook for the Philippines. In terms of the reserve requirement ratio, again, one of the tools of the BSP, a cut to the RRR is possible uh, should inflation decelerate significantly in the coming months. So the central bank, Again, still targeting a single digit requirement by 2023. And this is uh, very important in terms of market liquidity. So right now, uh, banks are required 12% uh, to, uh, to be inside uh, the BSP in terms of reserve requirement. And if that lo lowers into a single digit uh, environment, that again would provide a lot of liquidity to our local banks. And this would be a main driver in terms of where interest rates would be going. So another cut in triple R is again a bullish uh, move in terms of local interest rates. Now for inflation, again, uh, I'll be discussing this in length uh, for the next three slides. In June, the BSP revised their inflation forecast for 2021 up to 4%. And this, again, uh, I think David already mentioned this from 3.9% in May. So they actually uh, move it higher from just two months ago, mainly due to higher oil prices. In terms of growth outlook, the government target is at 6 to 7% for 2021. And I think admittedly, this is very bullish uh, for our central bank. Most likely, they would miss this target given the slow but improving vaccination drive and inflation worries. Uh, now, global GDP, on the other hand, is to grow at 6.1% and advanced economies to grow at 5.2%. In terms of emerging markets, India and China will be leading the growth in that area. Now let's move on to the local inflation uh, situation. Now 2021 inflation outlook significantly higher, is significantly higher from the 3.2% uh, that the BSP was saying in December, end of December. Uh, 2020. This went as high as 4.2% in March when we saw that the year-in-year -year inflation was at 4.7%. So in terms of uh, inflation outlook, it is very fluid. So just in a couple of months and also in a couple of new factors, uh, these types of uh, outlooks could be, uh, could be very different from where it was uh, in just three or five months. So again, uh, that is uh, giving us uh, some space to be nimble in terms of positioning. Now, if you look at the average 2021 monthly year-on-year -year inflation, uh, year to date, 
uh, this is already for June, is at 4.41. And just this morning, we saw the June inflation at 4.1%. So this is actually much uh, better than was expected. So uh, around the third month of the year, uh, many were saying that inflation could hit 5%. Uh, but then it, it started to decelerate, mainly because of uh, more moderation in terms of food inflation. But again, there are some risks. Uh, to these types of uh, to this outlook uh, at four percent it could probably uh, move higher from there but if you look at the base of uh, acceleration it has moderately slowed uh, in the past uh, four months now if you look at this graph uh, the two to four percent is really the target of the bsp and this is where they deem inflation to be healthy so for the past uh, actually, for the whole of 2021, it has reached that level already. So uh, this is what is keeping interest rates elevated at this point. Now, inflation risks are moderately lower. So in terms of the factors inside inflation, food and transport costs together contributed around 300 basis points to the 4.5% inflation uh, print that we had uh, the previous month. So again, these two factors are the things that we are going to focus on. Now, in terms of oil prices, oil prices pressure on local inflation, the 2021 average year-to-date price is at 62.3 per barrel. Uh, but if you look at the end of June price, it's already at 73.5. Uh, uh, dollars per barrel. So that is problematic in the sense that if you look at where the BSP is spending their hopes on in terms of achieving a 4% average inflation for 2021, they are looking at around a $63 uh, dollars per barrel average for the whole of 2021. So if you look at uh, where oil prices are going, that uh, would probably prompt them to increase their inflation outlook in the next few months if oil prices are going to stay at these types of elevated levels, above $70 per barrel. So for sure, uh, a lot of you are already feeling that pinch already in terms of uh, gas prices. Now, the elevated prices are due to the OPEC plus crisis. So this is actually uh, quite a new development. So the clash between longtime allies, UAE and KSA, on an increase of production required by the market. So one of the players are actually unwilling to increase production up until uh, the next year. So again, this is providing some conflict and this is providing some elevation in terms of uh, outlook on uh, oil prices. So again, that's one of the risks to the inflation outlook. Now, a positive risk is really the moderating food inflation. So African swine fever, this is the main story uh, locally. Um, that, that has driven meat prices uh, to record highs in uh, 2020. This was first detected in 2019 and has spread across 12 regions and 46 provinces. So this is a um, whole of Philippines problem already. This reduced swine population by around 3 million hogs, 100 billion in losses for the hog sector and related industries. So uh, in April 2021, they declared a state of calamity until the end of 2021. Uh, there were a couple of initiatives. They gave a price ceiling for pork and other meat products, uh, which already ended in April. And this has provided some mixed results. But in terms of the effect, in terms of year-in-year -in -year inflation, this has actually helped in moderating the acceleration of uh, CPI or the year-on-year -year inflation. So again, uh, these are the two risks that we're looking into. Uh, one of them is uh, negative, which is oil prices. Another is positive, which is your moderating food inflation. Now, uh, again, when it comes to CPI locally, although the rest of the world is very much focused on core inflation, uh, locally we are, uh, the BSP uh, especially, is really focused on the headline inflation. Uh, but again, uh, it's good to note uh, in terms of expectations, uh, the core inflation is actually proving manageable at 3.3%. So they are, in terms of core inflation and not headline inflation, is actually below the 2 to 4% target of the BSP. Uh, because, mainly because of demand side pressures are still weak, uh, given that our economy is not yet that uh, open.
relative to what we are seeing in developed markets. So again, uh, once we start to open up, uh, especially if uh, schools um, get back on track, but again, this is a story for next year. So that would probably push, uh, give some demand um, push in terms of inflation uh, considerations. Now, when you talk about uh, U.S. inflation risk, uh, this would most likely drive the uh, Fed's outlook. And uh, I, I know uh, David already touched on this, but if you look, uh, if you compare it, or if you're related to the story uh, locally, uh, it's not necessarily similar. But then again, they are very much exposed to uh, very similar uh, factors, and mainly because of uh, commodity prices. Uh, they don't necessarily have problems when it comes to food inflation, and in terms of demand push uh, type of inflation, it is very much more pronounced in developed markets uh, relative to what we're seeing here locally. So if you look at US inflation, 2021 at 2.98% average, and the latest print was at 5%. So it's actually uh, much faster than what we're seeing here locally in terms of year in year inflation already. Now, uh, I'll be providing here a uh, recap in the first half and the second half outlook for local fixed income. So for the start, since the start of the year, we have seen our interest rates move significantly higher, especially in the first quarter. So if you look here, uh, your 20 year of 101 uh, basis point already, and mostly that was what we saw in the first quarter. Your five years started the year at 2.5% currently at the end of at the end of uh, June at 3.02%. So again, in terms of the movements, the first quarter where we saw the start of the above 4% print, this is where the local interest rates actually move uh, significantly higher. But the good thing is this actually opened up a lot of opportunities for fixed income investors. So if you can imagine, but, uh, at the start of the year, you could invest in a 10-year bond at 3%, but in just a matter of six months, uh, it went up as high as 3.92% at the end of June. At the end of March, it was actually much higher than that. So that was when, uh, in terms of positioning, a lot of fund managers, including myself, actually increased the duration um, exposure of the funds that we are managing. And again, these are the types of movements that, that, that we are looking into in terms of trading uh, the market uh, in terms of these types of context. Uh, it's very volatile, and this is mainly driven by the volatile nature of inflation outlooks. Again, the main pin to the, to the equation is your central bank is going to remain at 2%, and that will provide support. Uh, for the short-term bonds, but again, the longer longer-term bonds would provide some volatility for us to trade the market. If you look at the returns for the first quarter, your all bond index was down negative 5.58 percent, but by the second quarter, it was up at 3.22 percent. So uh, these are the type of movements on a quarter and quarter basis that we would like to uh, consider or take advantage of as fund managers. Now, the risk factors for the second half outlook. Central bank would be a positive risk. And this would pin the demand on local government securities. And liquidity is flush for new issuances. So even though the borrowing program of the government has been increasing steadily, especially in June, uh, in terms of liquidity, overall market liquidity, and if you look at the auctions that have been uh, given out in the past uh, two months, there is some healthy demand for uh, local government securities. In terms of inflation, this is one of the main risk, major risk, and which which would most likely result to a steeper curve, meaning your longer uh, end bonds would underperform underperform your short end bonds. In terms of GDP growth, risk to growth remain abound, but not to the detriment of the credit rating outlook. So, in terms of uh, this particular risk factor, it wouldn't really affect much on the movements of interest rates. I think this would affect uh, your riskier assets uh, in the medium term. Global interest rates, FOMC, tapering, uh, hawkish stance to remain a risk 
although price action recently uh, so far remains greater, meaning the correlation of your US treasury rates and your local interest rates have actually been solid in terms of the movements. And I think uh, given the price action, this would not necessarily prove to um, give that much volatility in the next uh, few months. Now, bond supply, again, is uh, another risk. Uh, with supply concentrated on the five years and up, the curve will most likely steepen further out. So meaning because of increased uh, supply in your five-year, seven-year, 10-year, and even 20-year bonds, this will most likely uh, provide some uh, uh, bearish uh, outlook for your longer-term bonds, and but not necessarily your short-term bonds. And that's why the intermediate term is proving to be a very uh, sweet spot in terms of positioning. Now, in terms of technicals, short end bonds continue to rally. Uh, table options telling us liquidity is concentrated, very much concentrated on short duration. Four years and up should rise gradually, especially if inflation outlook turns out worse than expected. So again, your main risk is inflation. Uh, your main negative risk, I mean, your main positive risk is your central bank uh, still a very accommodative accommodative but in terms of technicals we will uh, be seeing some uh, volatility especially if your inflation outlook changes uh, in the next uh, few months now let's string it all together we are facing some transitory cost push inflation factors on food and commodity prices so hopefully it will be transitory but then again uh, it would be advisable to be nimble especially with uh, oil prices above $70 per barrel. However, the confluence of rising commodity prices and improving outlook in the economy can cause demand pool factors to come into play. So once we start opening up, then that's another layer of inflation risk that we could be facing. And also this would prompt your central bank to start thinking about uh, raising interest rates. But then again, our expectation is this would be for next year already, the end of next year. Now, persistent above-target inflation could lead to central bank unwinding their current policies. This would cause both fixed income and equities to sell off, similar to what we saw in 2018. So those are the main risks tied into inflation. Now, in terms of risk tied into the central banks, market is on edge on the next move of major central banks, particularly the FOMC. So even though your local uh, central bank is pinning their benchmark rate, it doesn't mean that the local interest rates would not be affected by what's happening in developed markets. So again, that's something that we would be closely watching. Now, the BSP is set to support the economy through easy monetary policy until we get back to 2019 GDP levels. So that's one of the uh, thresholds that they're seeing before they start uh, twitching again the monetary policy, local monetary policy. Now, in terms of U.S. Uh, interest rates, FOMC is communicating a similar message, both using the word transitory. But market reaction is viewing it differently, especially in what we're seeing with U.S. Again, uh, they're trying to um, temper uh, any talks of tapering, but I think the market is getting that eventually it would come into play uh, in the next few months. Point is that the type of accommodation the central bank is using at this point is inconsistent with uh, the inflation outlook. So again, the main player that we're trying to focus on is really central banks, and, uh, and hopefully um, this would uh, what I what I've said would provide you some uh, support in uh, really selling the funds that we're having now. In terms of the local funds, the local fixed income funds, I think it should provide some decent returns, especially given the, the early correction that we saw at the start of the year. Now, there are some risks, especially inflation, but I think uh, in the next six months, especially if there's no uh, abrupt movement in U.S. Treasuries, uh, your local fixed income market could provide you uh, decent returns, especially relative to the risk that it provides. And that's it. Thank you, MJ, back to you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, once again, uh, Sir Ricky Madatu, our AVP and Head of um, Fixed Income from uh, ProLife UK Investments. Thank you very much. And uh, I would say those were really, you know, practical and good insights on the local bond market, especially to those, uh, Sir Ricky, you know, who are interested in uh, investing in the local bonds. And as uh, Sir Ricky has mentioned, we are expecting a favorable local fixed income. Tama ba ako, Sir Ricky? And this is mainly due to the uh, initiatives of the BSP, you know, adjusting the interest rates to manage the inflation risk and all that. And um, yeah, so I guess we will hear from uh, more of Sir Ricky during our Q&A later. So Sir Ricky, thank you again and uh, we'll see you later in our Q&A. All right, okay, so now from uh, global financial markets to the local bond markets, we now move to the local equities market so it's now time to hear a fresh outlook and insights on how the uh, local stock market is doing how is it uh, performing right now and how do we see it perform for the rest of uh, 2021 and we have tonight the assistant vice president and head of equities of uh, pro life uk investments uh, mr charles long but allow me to uh, share with you his uh, background he has 15 years of investment experience with 10 years spent as an equities broker in Hong Kong. And uh, prior to joining Pro Life UK Investments, he also held notable positions as fund manager and head of equities in various financial institutions in the Philippines. And he graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in economics and management of financial institutions from the De La Salle University. And he also finished postgraduate studies in Hong Kong University of Science and Technology with a master's degree in financial analysis. So let's give a virtual warm welcome to our third speaker, again, our AVP and head of equities from ProLife UK Investments, Mr. Charles Wong. Good evening, Sir Charles, and it's uh, nice to have you again on ProWise. Good evening, MJ. Um, I'm glad to be um, here again. Of course, I'm grateful for the opportunity to present and to speak to uh, a lot of our um, clients and maybe uh, potential clients here in uh, this uh, webinar. And uh, of course, um, I'm ready, actually. So can I start, MJ? Yes, go ahead, sir. We're all excited. <laughs> so uh, let me start turning to a slideshow. Oh. Okay, is this okay? Can, is, is this clear? Yes. All right, so uh, let me start now. Uh, of course, um, thank you as well to David. You've made my presentation a lot easier. Uh, you've been bullish equity and so am I. Uh, so we'll, let's start with the first slide here for the local Philippine equity. So what you see is on the chart here is the black line is the PSEI. And more importantly, uh, the gray bars is actually the foreign flows. So our story or our uh, weak story has been the continued flow outflow of foreign capital from our markets. So it's been 20 straight months already of foreign outflow. The last time we had recorded that actually back in October of 2019. So for year to date, uh, foreign outflow has already been at 69 billion pesos. Uh, mind you, we are only at June and we're already about 60% of what went out in 2020. 2020, the outflow was about 110, and we've already experienced three consecutive years of foreign outflow. And this has been uh, a confluence of a lot of factors that foreign investors have viewed as negativity, negatively, of course. Number one front most is, of course, the political uh, issues that I have uh, regarding uh, a lot of the uh, regulatory uh, framework or the regulatory uh, impositions by the government on the various business uh, sectors. Well, of course, for June, uh, this is the second month of uh, positive return for this year, uh, so around, along with May, where we experienced a 4% increase. Uh, the good news is that with the two straight months of uptake, we also experienced some level of increase in the volume turnover. However, foreign outflows continue to remain uh, there, although we did experience about a eight-day reprieve, wherein we experienced four, eight straight days of foreign inflow, about roughly about six and a half billion pesos. 
So we have here, of course, the results of Q1. We were down about 9.8%. Q2, uh, a slight improvement of about gaining 3.6%. And when you look at the list of the leaders and laggards, of course, the leaders mostly are the consumer-based companies, uh, what we term as the anti-COVID companies like Emperador and a part of that also DMC and ICT, which derive uh, about close to 80 or 70% of its revenues from global trade, which has been quite strong in the last 12 months or so. The laggards continue to be the big um, growth companies or the big cyclical companies, the property, Meg and R Robinson's land. And of course, we have a gambling casino company, Bloomberry, uh, which continues to suffer right now. But there are some good news coming for this company companies as well in the next few months. So when we compare our performance to our neighbors, uh, David actually presented a slide of this one. Uh, and I want to emphasize as well, we continue to be the laggards here. Uh, this table has been uh, made to, to show you the top portion is ASEAN, and then we have North Asia and some developed markets like the US and Germany. The most important factor is actually valuation wise. For the Philippines, our P is right now about 19.6. Uh, this is already at our average of the last uh, 10 years. And it's very, very close to the peak valuation that we reached back in 2018 and 2013, which was 21 times. Kumbaga, uh, we can say that it's a ceiling for our markets. So we need to see earnings actually come through uh, for that to improve further. And when you look at uh, our attractiveness versus the other Asian neighbors, we are actually close to the highs, uh, barring India, of course, and the US. Uh, when compared to other Asian neighbors, we are actually quite expensive already. Okay, so from valuations and markets, we now move on to one of the more important factors is actually our COVID and our COVID response. And what we hear, see here is actually the movement restriction. This is from Google Mobility figures. And on the left side, you have retail and recreation, which encompasses all the uh, sales or the retail activity. And on the right-hand side is public transportation use. So the ones highlighted in red uh, rectangles are the ones where we have the strict lockdowns, uh, ECQ and, and ECQ. So last year, what we saw in 2020, when we started, when the government started initiating the strict lockdowns, uh, we have a 90% decline in both retail and recreation and transportation. So this is in comparison to the baseline figure of Feb 1, 2020. And from there on, uh, we had another round of MECQ sometime August of 2020, which hit hard on mobility as well. And we had another third lockdown uh, just this year from end of March towards uh, May. And what we saw is that on the third lockdown, despite an initial drop of minus 80%, we have slowly uh, climbed back up in terms of mobility. And when you look at retail and recreation, it's actually very uh, close to the pre-lockdown or the pre-third lockdown that we experienced. Of course, right now uh, for the Philippines, uh, retail and recreation is still at negative 31. Uh, but NCR and Cebu, we had a strong improvement. Right now, uh, Davao is experiencing a, another round of lockdown, which would end July 15. And that is why you can see a big deterioration in terms of their mobility. But hopefully after July 15, we can see Davao recover as well. So these three major, major economic centers of the Philippines uh, pretty much dictates how our economy will move. In terms of public transportation, um, it's still pretty much uh, steady. Uh, the government is still imposing that 50% uh, capacity on a lot of our public transportation, and that's pretty much been steady all around. However, we did see some spike uh, back in December of 2020. Uh, however, we do not see any improvement for public transportation use yet, but the other factors are, are pointing to an improvement in mobility. So from mobility, we have here, um, quick snapshot, so David also presented this a while ago, uh, of the countries with at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine already. So uh, the focus here is Asia, uh, where we actually initially, uh, I think about last month, we were still lagging behind in terms of vaccination when compared to the world, which I highlighted here. So for the first time uh, since about 
January or December when we started vaccination, Asia has actually overtaken the world already. However, the bad news is that the Philippines continue to be very weak. Uh, currently, I think our case is now at 8.1, uh, 8 8.2% already. So there are three important figures to look at when you look at this chart. Number one is 70%, uh, which a lot of the doctors and medical group have said as the level where herd immunity will be rich. However, there are two more numbers that are important for financial markets. It's 10 and 40. So 10% pretty much creates a base for our equity markets. So we are very near that already. And the market has anticipated that about three weeks in advance. So for our PSEI, 6,600 will remain a strong support for us. Uh, so we pretty much uh, factored in 10% and 6,600 is a strong support. So the next big number is 40%. And when, we, when I say 40, it's because uh, it's the level where a lot of the developed markets have started easing restrictions. And 40% will pretty much uh, guarantee a removal of pretty much all of the restrictions that we have here in the Philippines. So most likely we would be able to move from the current GCQ to the MGCQ, which is the lightest of all restrictions. And that would pretty much occur when we hit 40%. So 70% is pretty much um, not no restrictions anymore, but 40 would be the next level. And we're likely to hit 40% sometime around uh, of November, which means the market may start moving sometime September or October. So I'll, I'll brief you more on that one later on. Okay, so focusing on the Philippines uh, right now, the current figure is that we have, the country has vaccinated a lot, about 11.7 million individuals. So 8.8 .8 million is, has received the first dose, which is about 8.1% of the population. And 2.8 million has received about the second dose, which is about 2.63. So 10% is pretty much uh, given ready this July. We should hit that figure. 40% would be hit sometime about uh, the fourth quarter. And uh, by second, first quarter of 2020, we should be able to hit the herd immunity level of 70%. So Q4 is a very important thing. And I will tell you on later uh, with my... Uh, further on with the other slides. Okay, so in terms of inflation, uh, both of my colleagues have already discussed about them. Uh, the question is, is peak inflation already passed? Uh, most likely we can, we can say uh, yes. Uh, April, May was pretty much the deepest of lockdowns that we have seen both in the US, which is represented on the left side and Philippines on the right hand side. So the base effect would pretty much wear out uh, from here on up to the next few months. And we can expect inflation to likely uh, move around this level or pretty much may taper further. But of course, it all depends on how oil moves. Uh, as you know, oil directly and indirectly affects about 50% of our CPI basket. Okay, so in terms of employment for the Philippines, which is the jobs data, on the left-hand side, uh, you see that our unemployment rate has... Um, already come down significantly from the peaks we experienced back in um, 2020. Uh, we did have that little spike about two months ago when we initiate reinitiated lockdown, but currently our unemployment rate stands at about 7.7%, which is just a few percentage points from the uh, lowest that we've experienced back in March of 7.1 during the pandemic. Uh, these are all good numbers, but when you look at on the unemployment by age, uh, this shows you quite a disturbing figure. Uh, the unemployed people, both for the ages 15 to 24 and 25 to 34, has increased. And this pretty much um, tells you that the low-income wages or the low-income jobs continue to suffer. And, of course, we'd like the economy, uh, in order for the economy to recover, uh, employment for these age groups needs to improve uh, because they are the main, or we have the greatest number of working people around these two age groups. Okay, so when I started researching about uh, long-term effects of health crisis back in, going back as far as 100 years ago, uh, what I discovered was there was actually none. Uh, but because COVID and the actions of governments morph a health crisis to a financial crisis, we actually have one uh, long-term effect. And that is the 
national savings rate for the Philippines has actually increased uh, every time we experience financial crisis. And at the initial stage of a crisis, uh, the national savings rate actually fell. Sorry, I forgot to mention the red boxes indicate actually recession periods or crisis periods. And we have about uh, closely about four, including COVID-19. So what I saw is that initially at the start of the crisis, the national savings rate actually went down a bit uh, due to people getting laid off and businesses actually closing. But as the crisis uh, moves away and the economy recovers, savings rate bounces up. And eventually about a year or two years after the crisis, uh, the savings rate actually goes above uh, the pre-crisis savings level, which is uh, a silver lining as you can uh, uh, look at it. And hopefully, uh, maybe by 2023, our national savings rate can climb above 25% already. Of course, uh, in terms of our history, that's the highest. But when compared to us, other Asian neighbors, we are still lagging uh, quite far behind, uh, especially, especially when you consider the countries with highest savings rate are China, which is about 50. And then we have next Japan and South Korea with about close to about 30%. Okay, so we have to talk about this, although we always try to avoid politics when we talk about the business economy and markets, but uh, we are near it already. So a while ago, I mentioned 40% uh, would most likely be uh, the levels wherein we can say that restrictions can be minimized. It's partly because it falls right smack into the calendar of the elections. Uh, mind you, uh, November will be the last day, no, no, October 29 will be the last day of the filing of candidacy. So pretty much um, politicians have an incentive to make sure that vaccinations roll out as quickly as possible. And when campaign period starts by next year, around February, uh, they also want to make sure that they can freely move around and voters can also move around to join the campaigns. Uh, right now, uh, with the latest survey ratings, we have um, Mayor Sara Duterte leading at 27%, and there's a breakdown of where most of those votes would come from. The surprising thing is that um, the ABC group are largely in favor of Sara Duterte as well as uh, when you compare from before. Uh, ABC group are currently the ones uh, highly supported of uh, Mayor Sara Duterte. And of course, surprisingly, in second place is um, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. or Bong Bong at 13%. And then we have Grace Po at 12 So uh, one of the striking features of this current election and even the last one is the lack of opposition. And the opposition right now is very weak and they need to regroup and to uh, formulate a strong strategy if they are determined to win. Uh, right now, the current... Uh, candidate or the strongest candidate from the uh, opposition side is, of course, Vice President uh, Lenny Robredo, which is pretty much uh, very low in the ratings. Okay, so from there on, we now move to um, a technical chart that I've added uh, just to tell you where we are in terms of our index. So back in May, we saw a pattern where back then we actually called for a recovery in the market. So we have this... Uh, wedge structure uh, wherein we saw May uh, maximum uh, negativity has been priced in the market. And we also saw volatility drop significantly, which was a very strong recipe for a bounce in the market, which we saw happen in June. And right now we are actually trading close to about 7,000. Uh, we believe that we should be, or most likely we'll be trading in a range of about 6,600 to about 7,130, uh, which was the opening of the year at 7,130. And most likely the sideways action would last up until end of September. Uh, we traditionally have weak markets on ghost months, which is around August and September. And of course, uh, there will be some actions uh, with markets anticipating announcement of taper by the Fed. Their next two meetings would be uh, end of July. There's one in July and I think another one in September. So. The most likely uh, hood or the most likely move for the market is that we can see an acceleration towards uh, Q4 already, maybe sometime October, September, October, just in time when we are about to hit 40% uh, 
inoculation level for the population. So this is the type of move that we are looking at for the Philippine market right now. Okay, in summary, uh, finally, we are seeing some light shining into our equity markets in the Philippines. Uh, sentiment has significantly improved starting June. Uh, before June, a lot of the investors and um, fund managers that I know are trying to avoid the markets, raising as much, much cash as they can. Right now, the sentiment has changed to raising as much, much cash to actually buying on the dips. So market is actually pricing in an earnings recovery and improving economy. So right now for the second part, uh, we do believe that inflation currently has peaked, although it may remain elevated due to oil, but at least we know that uh, inflation most likely um, has seen its highs for the year. Uh, a lot of the supply side constraints that we saw uh, for the last 12 months are starting to improve and we expect more improvement uh, post-September, mainly because the unemployment benefits for a lot of the people in the U.S. ends on September 30. So by October 1, it is now uh, more reasonable for them to get back to work. Currently, uh, staying unemployed and staying home actually earns you more than working. So once that program ends by October, we'll see a significant return of production. So for our Philippine market, so the PSEI bottom for 2021 is already in place. However, for a lot of investors who still want to come in, there's still opportunity. Uh, we are expecting the market to move sideways in the next two months. And most likely we will be able to surpass that previous high of 7,300, which we hit earlier sometime February. Uh, mind you, this is still a 5% gain from where we are right now. So quite significant upside left. Uh, towards the next five months uh, and end of 2021. So we are going to be focused on the reopening stocks. Uh, we do expect the banks and the consumer discretionary sector to recover first, and then the property stocks to be the laggards in the recovery. So that ends my uh, presentation. Mm -hmm.